Howdy. Well, I want to welcome everyone to Caldwell First Baptist Church and to Rodeo Sunday. And join us and uh, get ready to enter into worship. Well, um, as you know, the rodeo has come to Caldwell. That's right. And it is an exciting time. The, the buzz is going throughout the city. People are just getting extremely stoked about everything, and we are too. I know my family and I, we go to the rodeo every year, and so we are looking forward to this rodeo. We um, haven't been to the Caldwell Rodeo before, and so we are super excited about that. Well, um, we uh, want to, part of our service today is that we want to make sure and um, express our, our care and our love for the rodeo community. We're so thankful for them being a part of our community here in Caldwell and for all the things that they do. And so we want to hear a little bit more about um, who's here today, our, our guests, and a little bit more about the rodeo. So I want to invite Nikki to come on down and come share with us. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having us. We look forward to coming here every year with you guys. My name is Nikki Zachary. I'm a second generation board member on the Caldwell Night Rodeo. I'm also the queen coordinator and secretary treasurer this year. This is Rob Vavold. He's one of our directors. Next to me is Bobby Hall. She's Miss Caldwell Night Rodeo 2018. This is her second term. We have Kelsey Kaiser. Nicole Jordan and Maria Keller. So most, most of you guys know that this is the 84th annual Caldwell Night Rodeo. I don't know if you guys know that we have about 525 contestants this year. We have about, I think there's 40 contestants from Idaho entered in the Caldwell Night Rodeo. And we also have five local contestants that two are ranked in the top 20. So that's pretty impressive for Idaho. So a little bit about this week is we have um, Tuesday night's family night for the YMCA. Wednesday night is Man Up Crusade night, also family night. So um, kids ages 12 and under up to four get in with a paid adult ticket, which is fantastic if you want to bring the kids and wear your purple. Thursday night is our Power of Pink in honor, you know, for breast cancer and everything. So Friday night's Patriot Night and Saturday's the finals. Something else I don't know if you guys know about Caldwell Night Rodeo is we have been nominated 18 times for large, one of the top five large outdoor rodeos in the nation. But we definitely can be there without all of our volunteers fans, everybody that comes out and supports us. So we appreciate that so much. So thank you guys for everything. And I'm going to pass the mic off to Bobby. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having us here today. It's a beautiful church, and we're excited for this service. A little bit about what we didn't describe very well is these three, three, three girls are contestants vying for the title of Miss Caldwell Night Rodeo. And last night, they had their speech portion of the competition. And so they had to get up and give an impromptu speech that was, they had 10 minutes to prepare. And other than that, they had no idea what they were going to talk to about. So that's a little bit about their competition that they've done so far. Later this week on Wednesday, they have horsemanship. And they get to compete to be able to represent the great, not only the great rodeo, but the town of Caldwell as well. So let's get a round of applause for them, because they're amazing. <laughs> And then there, this week, along with the rodeo, we have Buckaroo Breakfast every morning, and I would like to invite you all to come out there and join us each morning uh, as we help out with the breakfast and mingle around with the community. Well, we are so glad that, that you are here, and 
Um, just want to uh, welcome any of our, of our guests as well who are here who don't normally come. We are so glad that you came and are worshiping with us. Um, as we get our service started this morning, would you bow with me in a word of prayer as we go to the Lord? Heavenly Father, we want to dedicate this service to you. And we pray, Lord, that everything we do here glorifies and honors you. We pray that you would um, exalt Jesus Christ in our service. Help us to remember and to think about what we have through the cross of Jesus Christ. And we want to thank you so much for everything that you've given us. Lord, you have given us a grace and you have given us truth. You have ministered, Lord, to us in a way that is beyond comprehension and in a way that no one else has because Jesus Christ has died for us and has given us life eternal. And for that, we are eternally grateful. We pray this in your name. Amen. Would you all stand up and greet one another this morning? Well, if we can all have a seat, if we can all take a seat, that's enough fellowshipping. Time for some music this morning. I want to welcome our musical guests here, Betty Adams Band. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you, thank you so much. We're so happy to be here today. And, uh, we're missing one important member of our congregation, Mr. Mickey Stritsky, but he called me yesterday morning and he says, Betty, I apologize, I'm gonna be gone for Rodeo Sunday. But he says, I have a joke for you. And I says, okay. He said, what do you call a whole bunch of Baptists that are all dressed up in cowboy clothes? And I said, I don't know, Mickey. He said, ranch dressing. <laughs> I want you to know I'm impressed with all of your ranch dressing today. You're all gorgeous and you look darling. And I had to smile at Pastor. He was walking around. He says, boy, he says, I'm having a rough time in these heels. <laughs> so, okay, here we go, Bill. Kick her off. Oh, when the saints go marching in, when the saints go marching in, oh Lord, I want to be in that number, when the saints go marching in, I'm 
just a weary pilgrim these great musicians. Down on my far right is Miss Michaela Shippey on that fiddle. Yes. And Bill Cates on the banjo from Meridian. Mark Stolpe from Boise on that stand-up bass. And my precious loves of my life, Miss Elaine right here singing, my niece Elaine. And Miss Lorinda Yamamoto Norton. Amen. And of course, your very, very own Miss Betty Adams. <laughs> I always forget about me. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> okay, this song is a very special one to me. My daddy was a cowboy, and he always watched men that wore boots. He would look and he'd say, he's a dude, if he wasn't a real cowboy, if he didn't have working boots on. But anyway, I love this song. It's called, God Must Be a Cowboy at Heart. Well, campfire, coffee from a tin cup in my hand. It sure warms the fingers when it's cold. And playing my old guitar, a friend I understand, sure smooths the wrinkles in my soul. Sleeping. A blanket for my bed Oh, it brings a peaceful feeling to my mind Then I wake up in the morning With an eagle overhead Makes me want to fly away before my time And I think God must be a cowboy He made grass and trees and mountains And a horse to be my friend And trails to bring old cowboys home again Well, night I just dream about 
about the mountains when I'm there. And the country is so pretty, it goes on and on for miles. And it takes away my troubles and my cares, yes. And I think God must be a cowboy at heart. He made wide open spaces from the stars. that believes that, let's hear it one more time. <laughs> I'm glad he loves country folk. Yep. Okay, Mr. Bill, he's going to sing Cry Holy" for us. Where Moses stood. Yes. Lord, I ain't no stranger now. Lord, I ain't no stranger now. I've been introduced to the Father and the Son. Stranger now, crying holy unto the Lord, crying holy unto the Lord. If I could, I surely would stand on that rock where Moses stood. Proper Moses stood. For yeah. sure. Okay, Miss Lorinda is going to sing a good old country gospel song called Jesus Hold My Hand.
dark, beautiful. Now we're going to do uh, one for our last uh, song in this segment that everybody knows. How many of you know I'll Fly Away? Woohoo! All right, what a choir. That's great. Okay, Bill, why don't you kick that off? That's for them, not for me. Okay, everybody. Um, this is just a quick reminder to please register your attendance. The pads are on the outside. Tear off a sheet and pass it in. If you are a regular attender, we know that you're probably usually here, but it would be really nice if you just put your name and phone number on the pad and pass it on over, mark the little box so we knew you were here. If you are a first-time visitor, however, not only would we like to have you fill out one of those sheets, we would very much like to have you visit our Welcome Center, which is just through these doors in the foyer, and we have a special gift for you to commemorate your visit. Women's Retreat's coming up. It's the first weekend in September, the 7th through 9th, but the early bird registration is August 19th. So that's coming up very shortly, just next week. So please register if you need more information. I'm sure you do. There's a sheet on the registration desk, also in the foyer. The um, uh, registration fees are a little bit complex depending on your accommodations and so forth, so you'll have to pick up a sheet to figure all that out. The following weekend, September 14 to 16, is the men's retreat at Warm Lake Bible Camp in beautiful Cascade, Idaho. You have until September 9th to register for that at the early bird price of $45. It is such a deal. So fellas, please get signed up for that. Now, Maria, where'd you go? Round of applause for Maria. <laughs> Maria and Debbie. Well, it is so nice to be here 
nice to be visiting with you in this way. Do you know that there are only seven days until my children start school, and I may be counting it down. I may be. So along with that special event, that first day of school, we are starting children's ministry coming up in September, and I wanted to take the opportunity to introduce you to, for the first time, Seeds of Faith CFBC Kids. It's the new uh, logo and um, vision for our ministry to children here at Caldwell First Baptist. And the founding verse is from Psalm 78, verse 4, telling the coming generation the wondrous, wondrous deeds of the Lord. And with that, there are so many wonderful things that God has placed on my heart to plan for kids, VBS and special events and choir and all sorts of things, but in the same way are the nitty-gritty details like schedules and curriculum and teachers and volunteers. And so all through that, all these overwhelming things that are coming into my mind, God kept reminding me of two words. And those two words are foundation and eternity. And so what I really wanted to communicate to you today was that we are hoping to set a great foundation for our children in children's ministry because without that purposeful and thoughtful vision for children's ministry and that foundation being set then all these wonderful events that we might plan they may not go anywhere but with that foundation of having God's word really be placed on those children's hearts and to be a firm um, steady solid rock for them Hopefully, we will see spiritual growth for them. And also, eternity, because it's really on my heart that we are every day, one day closer to eternity. And I just really want to help these children to develop that biblical perspective of having eternity in their hearts. And so, with that, we are committed to consistently sharing the gospel with our children. Trusting God to change their hearts so that they have a desire to live Christ-focused and spirit-led lives. And... To do that, we're going to provide a biblical foundation, like I said, teach the whole counsel of God so that they understand that Christ was God's intention from the, from the foundation of the world, and to encourage them in, in their development of their spiritual gifts, give them opportunities to share with the congregation and the community, and provide opportunities then for them to share the gospel with a larger community. I'm Debbie Buxton, I'm the nursery director, and so anyone that has um, currently been signed up to volunteer, whether downstairs or in the nursery, or considering volunteering in the children's ministry, is invited to attend a volunteer brunch on Saturday, August 25th. So the brunch will be served at 9 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall downstairs, so you're going to RSVP to uh, registrate on the registration slip or at the booth in the lobby. We have some cool tickets. And if you RSVP at the booth, you can enter a special prize. Mm -hmm. And regardless, all who attend will receive a prize. So hope to see you there. Thank you so much. Well, we uh, are going to, after the service, be inviting all of you to come have lunch with us. And we have a potato bar downstairs, and people are down there preparing it now and getting it all ready for you. And I do want to mention that there's going to be one line being formed, and it's going to be on the west side stairwell, your right-hand side. So that's the stairwell where they'll be lining up, and then we're going to form a line going that way. Um, and uh, all have a great time of fellowship together. So everyone here is welcome. I hope you can all stay for our potato bar. It's going to be a great time of fellowship and food. Well, this is a time of our offering, and um, this is a time where people who are regular tenders here um, give to the Lord. And if you're just visiting, I, I don't want you to feel compelled to give. Um, there's, there's no paid admission here. So we're just glad you came and, and glad that you're worshiping with us. But for those of us who worship here regularly, this is our time to worship the Lord by giving um, a little bit back to him, acknowledging that he gives us all things. Amen? Amen. As the ushers come forward, uh, would you bow with me in a word of prayer? 
Heavenly Father, we want to pray that you would take this offering and use it for your ministry, your glory, Lord, to help us to use it wisely. And uh, we pray that it would continue to reverberate throughout eternity as it goes out to ministry here in Caldwell, um, Idaho, and then to the outer reaches of the world. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, bless your word to us today, Father. We pray that you would uh, minister to our hearts and our souls and that you would um, lead us to follow you when you call. And we pray all these things in your, your name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. And uh, we want to share a song now. We want to feature our little fiddler, Michaela. She's um, 18 years old, and she's contending for the national championship in Nashville. And so we just want to feature her on the fiddle, playing a hoedown. The Lord says, come before his presence with singing. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. And there's no more joyful sound in my book than the sound of a good old fiddle playing Black Mountain Rag. So here we go. amazing music we have we we love all different kinds of music here at the church don't we and we have been blessed so much with such a an amazing amount of uh, musical abilities and talents uh, in every way and I'm so thankful for that well I get to share with you a little bit of God's word this morning and um, as I was thinking about rodeo Sunday I was thinking you know how cowboyish am I and um, I am somewhat familiar with cowboy culture, um, just a little bit so that I just know a few things. For instance, um, I do know the primary purpose of cowhide. The primary purpose of cowhide is to keep the cow all together. I know that. I understand that. I do know that when you see three people in a pickup truck 
and they're all wearing cowboy hats, I know how to identify the real cowboy or cowgirl. They're the ones sitting in the middle, so they don't have to open up the gates. <laughs> well, um, I'm somewhat of a weekend warrior. I, I grew up uh, in the city uh, living with my mom, but on the weekends, I grew up at my dad's out in the country, and my dad loves horses. And so um, he loved to ride, and, and so I grew up riding, and my, and my stepmother uh, was, for a living, was a horse trainer, and she did lots of barrel riding and different things like that, and um, I grew up with all the trophies in the house and, and things like that. Um, and the thing that, uh, that my folks really liked to do was called horse cutting. Now, um, you're not going to probably see that at the rodeo, um, and it's not horse mutilation. What horse cutting is, is it's a sport um, that involves um, a herd of cattle, and you take a horse in there who has been trained how to basically herd cattle. And so the horse comes in and separates one cow out from the herd, drives them out, and then the horse stands in between them, and then you get ready for the show. Because the cow, by nature, wants to get back to that herd. And so as it's, it's juking back and forth to get back to that herd, a good cutting horse will juke back and forth to keep that cow from getting back to the herd. And, and how, how good you do is, is how you're rated. And so there's competitions about this sort of thing. Now, of course, this derived from the days when, when people used to have to um, guide ca cows by by horse, and, and so you would often need to separate a cow off or, or a steer, and you'd have to separate them so they could be branded or, or so that you could do whatever you needed to do, but you needed a really good cutting horse to be able to keep that cow separate so you could do what you needed to do. Well, I got to thinking about that, and I got thinking about cutting horses and the Lord. I got to thinking that there's a similarity between um, cutting a cow out of a herd and what the Lord does with us. You see, um, one of the things the Lord does is that he sends out a call to all people. Kind of like a, a, a cutting horse that goes in and cuts out a cow and says, um, I'm going to bring you out and I'm going to work with you and I'm going to keep you with me. The Lord does that and he calls all people out to come and to enter into a relationship with him. We see this call in the book of Acts chapter 2. And by the way, we're going to be kind of jumping around through different scriptures today, but we'll be having them on the board so you can see where we're going. Acts chapter 2, verses 38 through 39, is a passage uh, that is the first great sermon of the church. And so the apostle Peter is preaching to the Jewish people in Acts chapter 2, and he is telling them about this opportunity that they have to come to the Lord. And so as he's doing this, they say, what, can, what must we do to be saved? Now, remember that there are people from all over the known world at that time, and they're all Jewish people who are there to, to worship in Jerusalem. And so there's a huge variety of people here. And so this is the message that Peter gives in verses 38 and 39. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So there is a call that the Lord makes. It says this call goes out for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for, for anybody that you can think of. This is a call to turn in repentance to our Lord Jesus Christ, to be baptized and to receive the Holy Spirit into our very selves and be a follower of God. But then uh, the Apostle Peter went on to go be a minister to the Gentiles, and there was this question of, is God also calling the Gentiles? And perhaps when he, you know, he said to people everywhere, he meant only the Jews. And so Peter, or, I mean, excuse me, Paul explains this very clearly in Acts 17, verse 30, when he is on Mars Hill, and he is talking to the Athenians, and he, and he explains to them who this creator God is. And this is what he says in verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. The times when people did not know Christ, did not know God, God has overlooked those times with the coming of Christ, and he is calling everyone out to turn to him in repentance. And, and so this is the call that God has. Like a, like a cutting horse would go in and, and bring out a cow. He, he does this to every one of us. He calls us out. There's a lot of people who think, well, 
maybe God hasn't called me out. But it's very clear from these scriptures that God has called everyone to come into a relationship with him by repenting of their sin, believing in Jesus Christ. And it talks about this. I want to, I want to, if you're flipping with your Bibles with me this morning, would you turn to 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10? And I want to explain a little bit about what this gospel message is. What is it he is calling us to? And in 2 Timothy 1, 9 through 10, it talks about this wonderful calling that God has brought on people's lives. And I'm going to insert the word God there at the beginning because that's what he's talking about. It says this, God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So first of all, he tells us those who have been saved were called. And we were called to a holy calling. And that holy calling is that we follow our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not because of our works. It's not because of anything good we did. Thank the Lord, right? It's not because I'm a good person. But because this call goes out to every single person, no matter if we consider ourselves good or bad, the call goes out to every one of us. It goes out because of God's own purpose and grace. And it says that this purpose and grace was from before the ages began. So before the ages began, before time began, God had planned to call people to himself who had turned from him through Jesus Christ. See, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who is himself very God. And he is the full, complete representation of God who has come to this earth. And when Jesus came... And has done everything that God called him to do, like verse 10 says, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. When Jesus did that work through the cross by dying for our sins, becoming the substitute for, for the wrath that God had towards us and, and took all of that wrath upon himself, he abolished death, as verse 10 says. He has taken death and said, you don't have to die in eternal hell but you can live forever and have eternal life through jesus christ our lord that is the life he brought that is the immortality he brought and so that calling of coming into the light of god through the gospel which we would believe upon faith alone is what god is calling all of us to now let me ask you just a personal question in a room full of people have you ever experienced God's calling? Have you personally ever experienced God calling you? Perhaps maybe uh, it was when you were younger. Perhaps when you were a child, you went to church with your grandparents or you went to church with your parents and, and you felt that God was calling you. You heard the word of God preached and you thought, that's true. And, and I want to follow God. But, but maybe as life went on, that calling kind of faded in the distance. And you don't really remember that anymore. And you never really followed up on that call. You're kind of like that cow, right, who took off and just wanted to head back to the herd. Uh, perhaps you heard it on certain occasions. You know, I, I, I know, notice that people hear the call of God much more at a funeral service for a relative. When, when we go and we sit and we look eternity in the face when somebody close to us has passed away, all of a sudden we have a vivid um, understanding of the shortness of life and the brevity of life. We begin to start to hear God calling us and wondering, is God calling me? Should I follow the call of God? Perhaps you've had this happen when you have a, a near-death experience. Sometimes you get into real trouble and you realize that your life could come to an end at any moment. And a lot of people hear God calling at that moment. They begin to think about God and that he's been calling them perhaps all their lives, but it comes to them in a, in a blink of an eye. I had a friend who um, used to work at a feed store, and um, he wanted to go see the world, and so he got in his car, and he started traveling, and he started doing all these outdoorsy types of things, and sometimes he would do it alone. And one time he was out climbing on some cliffs. Why he was doing that alone, I don't really know. But he was climbing on some cliffs, and he lost his footing, and he fell down, and he grabbed onto a rock, and uh, that's all he was holding onto between him and certain death. 
And he realized that though he had heard about God all of his life in church, he had never really followed the call of God. And at that moment, the call of God was blaring through his ears as he was also thinking, I'm going to (laughs) die. And as he thought about dying, he thought about the fact that, that he hadn't followed up on God's calling. And when he pulled himself up off of that cliff, he said, Lord, I'm going to follow you now for the rest of my life. I'm going to answer your call. I'm now, I'm now, I get it. I understand the brevity of life and that you have given me life and breath and given me eternal life through Jesus Christ, and I believe it. Now, perhaps you've never felt the call of God and you saying, Pastor, I don't know what you're talking about. I have never felt the call of God. I have never experienced it. Well, sometimes it's not all that obvious to us. The scripture says that um, our hearts have been calloused by sin, and so perhaps God has called you, but you just haven't heard. It's kind of like that Chuck Norris joke. Yes, I'm going to do a Chuck Norris joke this morning. You've heard of these jokes because Chuck Norris is a a martial arts movie star, and there's all these jokes about how tough Chuck Norris is. And there's that joke that goes, um, after Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, he he, he rang up and was going to make a call, and he realized that Chuck Norris had already left three messages. It's kind of like that with God. Even if we haven't picked up the phone to receive the call, he's been calling. He's been calling you. As we know from Acts 17, 30, it says the time of ignorance of God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So the call is there. The call has gone out. But it's hard to receive it sometimes. But I want to guarantee you this, my friends. God has called generally all people to himself he's offering you an opportunity to come and be with him for eternity but like in horse cutting there is a tendency of all cows just about all cows and that is when god cuts us out of the herd and he calls us we have a tendency to run right back we have a tendency to run from the call of god i've seen this time and time again and i imagine that when um cutting horses in the past have have cut out cows that that part of the reason they didn't want to be taken out of the herd was because there was some branding going on. And, and I don't know a lot, but I understand that cows don't particularly enjoy the process. Well, a lot of people fear being marked by God. That, 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 that they are now labeled a follower of Jesus Christ, a Christian. They don't want to be put in a label. They don't want to be put in a box. It seems like a painful process to be under the lordship of Jesus Christ, to be under the lordship of anyone. That's a, a term we don't particularly love, to be under someone's lordship, and we become their servant. And even as Christians, we do sometimes tend to run away from the calling of God. There's an old hymn called Come Thou Fountain, and this is what it says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Every time I sing that, that's a powerful, powerful thing to me because I know that there's a tendency in all of our hearts, whether or not you know Christ or do not, to, to sometimes stray, to sometimes run back to the world and run back. And, and, and for those who know Jesus Christ, that can be a real tendency that we really have to fight because it's just a natural thing that we tend to do. When I moved to Idaho in October, I realized that I had a problem with my phone number because my uh, area code was 503. And I started calling people for the church, and I would call them, and they wouldn't answer. And some people I'd have to call two or three different times until I realized that people were seeing my area code, and they thought I was a telemarketer. So what was interesting is oftentimes if people did answer, it was with suspicion. It was, hello? Hello? What are you trying to sell me today? So I changed my phone number, and all of a sudden I get people answer right away now. 208. Sometimes we do that with God, right? Sometimes we, we, hear, we see him calling. We, we see the phone ringing. We, we know he's calling us towards himself, and we become very good at avoiding the phone call, right? We've got caller ID. Nope, Lord, I'm not going to answer that one. I I don't want to do it. I I don't want to answer your call. I I don't want to follow you, Lord. I know you you keep calling, but I don't really want to follow you. We're good at answering phone calls that we don't want. And this is nothing new in the Bible. The people of Israel did the very same thing. In Isaiah 65, 2, this is what God says to his people. I spread out my hands all day 
to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. In a sense, what he's saying is, I'm, I call you all day long. My hand is out to you for fellowship. I, say, I, I have my hand out to you all day long. I continually have my hand out. But my people, they turn away from me. They, they follow their own devices. They follow their, that's actually literal for us today, right? We follow our own devices. But for them at the time, their own devices were very similar. They were their own passions, their own desires, their own self-focus and purpose in life. And he's saying, I hold out my hand all day to you. I'm constantly calling you. Pick up the line. Pick up. And even new Christians did this in the book of Galatians 1.6. Paul says this, I'm astonished. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. He says, God called you to a gospel, and I'm astonished at how quickly you just turn from that and you run away. How, what a tendency we have when God cuts us out of the herd and wants to be with us to just run right back and be with them. But did you know that God will keep calling you even when you run from him? You know that, right? And, and, and does that just appeal to your heart that even when we run from god even when we when we turn away from him no matter where we go god pursues us god comes after us perhaps you remember the story about a runaway lamb that we ran away from the flock and the shepherd went after that one lamb and that then that little lamb ran away and got themselves lost and took off and 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 it would have been easy just to let him go but the shepherd went after that one little lamb and brought that lamb back because he wanted the lamb to be with him. And so God does with us. He continues to call us until we listen. Now, um, I want to explain this and illustrate this with a, a, a true story about a, a musician, not very well known, uh, but uh, maybe some of you have heard of him. His name's Johnny Cash. Um, <laughs> Now, you might be surprised to know that Johnny Cash, um, he just, he, he, he spread himself throughout all musical genres. Did you know that he's in the Country Music Hall of Fame, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and the Gospel Hall of Fame? There's a the Gospel Hall of Fame. <laughs> did you know he's in all three? An interesting character. But did you know also that Johnny Cash, all of his life, struggled to walk with God? Now, maybe perhaps some of you remember watching him on the Billy Graham Crusade um, when it was televised that he would actually sing for the Billy Graham Crusades. Well, he made a profession of faith at age 12, but after um, time went by, he got really popular in the music industry, and for years he struggled with alcohol and drug addiction and, and just a life of, of sin and debauchery. And he actually got to a point in his life where he was ready to call it quits, where he was ready to completely give up on life. And I want to read to you some of the things that he said in this particular instance when he almost died in a cave. On October 1967, Johnny Cash decided to end his life. Quote, I never wanted to see another dawn, he said. I have wasted my life. I had drifted so far away from God and every stabilizing force in my life that I felt there was no hope for me. So Johnny Cash made his way to Nickajack Cave in the Tennessee River, just north of Chattanooga, Tennessee. It was a system of caves, some of them larger than two or three football fields, that ran under the mountains all the way to Alabama. And he had explored these caves before, and he knew what was there. He knew that several people had lost their lives in these caves, usually by entering the wrong way and then losing their way. It, here's what he says. It was my hope and intention to join the people who had died, end quote. He thought through his plan. He would crawl in so far that he could never get out and die in a cave. He parked his Jeep just outside the cave. He entered it and crawled for nearly three hours until his flashlight lights went out. Exhausted, he laid down in total darkness. Here's what he says, the absolute lack of light was appropriate, for at that moment I was as far away from God as I had ever been. My separation from him, the deepest and most ravaging of the various kinds of loneliness I had felt over the years seemed finally complete. As he lay in the darkness waiting for death, Cash discovered a profound truth about God. Quote, I thought I'd left him, but he hadn't left me. He began to feel something powerful taking place in his mind and body. He started having a sensation of peace, clarity, and sobriety. 
the feeling of tranquility persisted and Cash began to focus on God. And here's what he says. There in Nickajack Cave, I became conscious of a very clear, simple idea. I was not in charge of my destiny. I was not in charge of my own death. I was going to die at God's time, not mine. I hadn't prayed over my decision to seek death in the cave, but that hadn't stopped God from intervening. Feeling the story of new hope, he began to crawl out of the cave. So, quote, I crawled in there with the flashlight until it burned out and I lay down to die. I was a mile in the cave. But this feeling, this great comforting feeling presence said, no, you're not dying. I got things for you to do. So I got up, I found my way out through cliffs and ledges and drop-offs. I don't know how, except God got me out. Amazingly, he emerged and his wife, June Carter, was there and his mother with a basket full of food and some things, some things to drink. The women told Cass that they knew something was wrong and felt led to come and find him. And it was from that point on that he decided that he was going to follow God's call. Perhaps that story resonates with you. Perhaps you've been at a point where you've been distant from God and you've not followed his calling. Or perhaps you've followed God for much of your life. But there are times when you feel yourself distant from God. My friends, if you distance yourself from God, he has told us through the Psalms, he will be there with you. He will continue to follow you. His call will constantly be with you. He will constantly be calling you to himself. He desires that you give in and ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior and be forgiven of your sins. And I want to leave you with one last point. It's important to remember that God will continue to call you, but there is one last call. We will all receive one final call. And I want to ask you to turn back to Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. This is the text where he is talking to the people of Athens, and he wants to let them know that it's time for the people everywhere to repent. The call has come out because we must remember there is a time for the last call. Acts 17, 30, and 31. I read 30, and then I'll read 31. The time of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance by, to all by raising him from the dead. You see, the Apostle Paul wanted everybody to understand that everybody is called to come to faith in him. Because there is a day when there's going to be a final call where you and I are going to stand before Jesus Christ and he's going to make a judgment. And in that judgment, he's going to determine whether or not we answer the call in life or we didn't answer that call. And if we did answer that call in, in, in our lives, he's going to say, enter into eternal life, my child. Come and enter in and sup with the Lamb for all eternity. You will be with me. You have answered the call. This is your final call to stand before me. And I have determined that you have had faith completely in me alone. And your price has been paid. Enter in. But for those who have refused to answer the call time and time again, that last call, he will call every one of us up to stand before his presence. And if we have not believed in Jesus Christ, he's going to say, I don't know you. I've been calling you for your life. But you've never answered You've never picked up the phone. You've never stayed with me. You always run back to the herd. And now it's too late. And so go into everlasting punishment. There's always a last day of the rodeo, right? And Saturday is the last day of the rodeo. And uh, I imagine that, that that day comes with a little bit of anticipation, but a little bit of dread, especially for those who are competing, that this is the last chance. This is the last chance to do well. This is the last chance to go ahead and, 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 and have a great score. And, and so it is with God. There is always a last chance. There is this moment that's always in the back of our mind that is coming. And so God wants us to answer the call now because he says in the word, today is a day of salvation. Don't wait until the last call. Hear the call he has in your life now and come and turn to him. And if you want to do that today, I want to encourage you. I'll be, I'll be here. Uh, Pastor Nate will be here. Pastor Daryl, we're around. Find an elder. And we'd love to talk to you about that. We'd love to, to help you understand the calling of Jesus Christ and come to him and, and finally turn to him in repentance and faith. Now, I found a cowboy prayer that I think illustrates this whole thing very well. And it says this. Our Heavenly Father, we pause at this time mindful of the many blessings you have bestowed upon us. We ask, Lord, that you will be with us in the arena of life. 
We as cowboys do not ask for special favors. We do not ask to draw around the chute fighting horses, the steer that won't lay or to never break the barrier. We don't even ask for all daylight runs. We do ask, Lord, that you will help us live our lives here on earth as cowboys in such a manner that when we make that last inevitable ride to the country up there where the grass grows lush, green, and stir up high, and the water runs cool, clear, and deep, that you take us by the hand and say, Welcome to heaven, cowboy. Your entry fees are paid. Amen? Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we want to praise you that you keep calling us. Lord, we can sure be stubborn. And I pray, Father, that you keep calling us out. Keep cutting us out of the herd. And and I pray, Lord, that, that when you do, make it obvious and clear and help us to turn to you and give up and say, Lord, you are my Lord. You've been calling me all my life and you want me to follow you. I pray for anybody here this morning who wants to make that decision that they do so and they don't hesitate, that they know in their spirit that this is the right move. And so I pray for that. Lord, I also want to pray for the rodeo. I pray for safety for everyone who competes. I pray for safety for um, all those who are here and those who couldn't make it, Father. Um, Lord, uh, they, they're doing this as, as uh, partly just an entertainment, but also, Lord, there is real danger involved. And so I pray for their safety. Pray for your covering and blessing on them as they compete and as they're involved. And we want to pray for all these things in, our name, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. If we can all stand, we want to close by singing one of the old hymns. It's called Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, and I think the lyrics are are on the screen. So, Lorinda, you want to lead us in that?
you love those old hymns. Amen. Me too. Well, we want to take it out uh, on one you all know, the good old Hank Williams gospel tune called I Saw the Light. And, uh, <laughs> and the lyrics will come up. How many of you know that? Let me hear you see your hands. Oh, whoo, again, going to have a good choir. Okay, kick her off, Bill. We're so happy to have y'all. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs>